Amen. In 1 Samuel chapter 18, as this story continues, as we're going through the life of Samuel and then Saul, and now David has entered into the picture. In the first verse there, in verse number 1, it says, And it came to pass when he had made an end of speaking unto Saul. Now, mind you, this is right after he killed David. I'm sorry, rather, David killed Goliath, and David cut off his head, and David went into the battle with cheese, and he came out with a giant's head, right? And so now he's standing talking to the king. The king honors him. And so when it says in verse 1, after the, he made end of the speaking unto Saul, that the soul of Jonathan was knit with the soul of David, and Jonathan loved him as his own soul. I want to point out that Jonathan has very Christ-like characteristics. Jonathan just saw this awesome battle take place where David was not afraid. He's encouraging those that were afraid. He said, give God the glory. He said, uh, God can give us victory. In fact, of Jonathan, if you remember in, in uh, 1 Samuel 14, he says, there is no restraint to the Lord to save us by many or by few. Right? Jonathan had a really awesome attitude. He was ten times better than his father, as we're seeing, whereas his dad Saul is sitting back. Jonathan is active. He's in the battle. He's moving forward. He's not afraid. Afraid. Uh, he said that it was a sign that the Lord had delivered them. And of course, he went, uh, Jonathan, and got this major victory. And so he had just eyewitnessed in chapter 17 when David had said uh, to, the, to the giant, he said, Thou comest to me with a sword and with a spear and with a shield, but I come to thee in the name of the Lord of hosts the God of the armies of Israel, whom thou hast divided. He goes on and he says uh, that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. That's what David wanted to know. That was his plan. He said, I am fearless because you'll find out that there's a God. So after Jonathan I witnessed this, Jonathan really had a very Christ-like heart. He loved them and honored those that honored the Lord. This is an attitude that we ought to have. We can learn something from the life of Jonathan. Uh, he is one of a few men in the Bible that it doesn't really say anything negative about, uh, much like a Joseph, you could say, or a Daniel, or a Job, a Jonathan. You could probably put him on that list. Obviously, he was a sinner just like we are. But the account that we're given, he did all these great things. And here, as he loved David, Listen, I have to ask you, what type of people do you love? Do you love them that love the Lord? I hope so. Uh, do you honor those that honor the Lord? Are you focused on those that want to work for the Lord? Because I believe that that's a godly characteristic. I think that's something that we ought to really uh, get focused on and not just uh, like people that could care less about the Lord. And listen, we love the lost. We preach to them and we love our family. But uh, when your heart is knit with somebody, it's because he, we see that they're doing this great work for the Lord and we want to be a co-laborer, a fellow laborer, a yoke fellow with them. Jonathan had that attitude. So in verse 2 it says, And Saul took him that day and would let him go no more home to his father's house. So now he was full-time working for the king. Then Jonathan and David made a covenant because he loved him as his own soul. We'll refer back to this covenant later. We won't go into it tonight. But they made a promise to one another for God's glory. Verse 4, And Jonathan stripped himself of the robe that was on him and gave it to David and his garments, even to his sword and his bow and his girdle. Now, uh, Jonathan didn't sin. He didn't take his clothes completely off. But what he did, if you notice, he took his kingly robe. Right? This was, he was royalty. And he's saying, wait a minute. The people look at me as somebody and I'm going to honor and humble myself before this man that did a great work for God. So I'm going to take the kingly robe and I'm going to put it upon David. Uh, it says he gave him his garments, even to his sword and his bow and his girdle. Now, he probably had a leather girdle that kept things together and his sword. Remember, Saul's stuff didn't work for him. And I, listen, I just have to say, uh, you... Kids and teenagers and young adults, I have to tell you that God can do great and mighty things with a young, humble, godly person. We have to remember this, that God, He doesn't want the king that has everything and He has a name for Himself. He couldn't work with that guy. 
He was too selfish and too prideful. God was looking for a willing young person that was humble and they wanted to help somebody else. And I say this to encourage y'all. Lawson, thank you for reading the scriptures tonight. Thank you for stepping up. You did a fantastic job. He probably pronounced some of those names better than I will, right? Uh, and then, listen, that's what we need. We, where are the youth in the churches? Well, we've sent them off. Not around here. I want to put them in the battle, right? When the Philistines are coming, I want, to, I want to know that our children are ready to stand on guard and fight against the devil and fight against the enemies and take the gospel out into the world. And God is looking for some very humble, godly living, spiritually minded children and youth, and teenagers, and young adults. Never forget that. So Jonathan gives him all his stuff, his honor, his royalty, his weapons, his armory. Verse 5, And David went out whithersoever Saul sent him, and behaved himself wisely. This is quite a statement. Behaved himself wisely. Now, just show of hands, how many people have ever had your parents say, Behave yourself. Who's heard that before? Just about everybody. And, and you children that haven't heard it yet, oh, you will, okay? Behave. Our behavior, how we act, how what we're known by. Now think about it. David behaved himself wisely. This is godly wisdom in the youth. He heard it from the time he was a child. He knew the Scriptures. He sang Scriptures and made Scripture songs that others would learn. He, gives, he gave us the Psalms and a lot of the Proverbs that we see, and even Ecclesiastes. These are, this is generational godly wisdom that was handed down. David was an extremely wise man. And it tells us that Saul sent him out to do his business, he sent him out to war, and David behaved himself wisely. Notice what it says, and Saul set him over the men of war. He made him a captain or a general, if you will. And he was accepted in the sight of all the people. The people saw this David is something else. He's got a good spirit. He has a godly mentality. He has wisdom when he speaks. It says, and also in the sight of Saul's servants, those that were closest to Saul, to the king, that saw the inner workings. They saw the true heart of service, compassion. Remember that David had said of him that he had a heart like the Lord's. And we, we're going to see this as David, even as he's attacked by Saul, he still loved Saul and helped him and cared for him. If you would go to Psalm 101, I want to focus on this statement for a second that he behaved himself wisely. It says it four times in this chapter. It says it more in uh, 1 Samuel 18 than anywhere else in the Bible. It talks about behavior. You're going to Psalm 101. We're going to look at a Psalm of David, his own perspective of his own behavior. Psalm 101, verse 2, it says, I will behave myself wisely in a perfect way. Oh, when wilt thou come unto me? I will walk within my house within a, with a perfect heart. Now, this is important. When you're in your house, no one else can see you. You will do things in your house that you probably wouldn't do in the church house. Is that true? Can I get an amen? Maybe you'll wear your hair in a certain way, or maybe you're just kind of in your underwear, your britches, because... You know, it's hot and I got the fan going and nobody else is here. I'm just going to, we're going to do certain things at home because we're relaxed, right? And that's okay. But what he's trying to tell us here, I will walk within my house with a perfect heart. David is trying to tell us when I'm at home and my hair is let down and I'm relaxed and I'm at ease and I've let my guard down and my true personality comes out, I want to know you, I want you to know what drives me. It's that I will have a perfect heart. David was not sinlessly perfect, no, but when, when you got to know who he really was, it's like we see that he, man, he really loves the Lord. He always wants to talk, bring things back to the Bible and bring things back to the Lord. In fact, look at verse 3. It says, I will set no wicked thing before mine eyes. Ooh, now wait a minute. He's talking about being in his house alone, walking perfectly even when no one can see him, and he will set no wicked thing before his eyes. Boy, we could make an application with this with 
television, your cell phone, inappropriate content on the internet, which, whatever form it comes to you, the Bible tells us that the thought of foolishness is sin. And I got to tell you, there are, there are some things on social media that maybe there isn't specifically a, a verse that says, thou shalt not do this. But there sure is a lot of foolishness that just wastes your time and wastes your mind. And ultimately, if it's not glorifying God, they're glorifying themselves, which is wicked. David is saying, when I'm at my house all alone and no one sees me but God, you know what? I'm not going to put something wicked before my eyes. Why? Because God made my eyes. He knows what I'm looking at. He knows what I'm thinking about. He knows what I'm dwelling on. And besides, as we saw in our daily proverb here, whatever you, uh, as a man, thinketh in his heart, right, what it say? So is he. If David was at home thinking on wicked things or doing wicked things that the rest of the kingdom didn't see, it would eventually manifest itself in public because that's who he is becoming what's in his heart. He says in verse 3, Psalm 101, verse 3, I will set no wicked thing before mine eyes. I hate the work of them that turn aside. It shall not cleave to me. When somebody turns aside and go, goes away from God, their works become abominable, something worth hating. David says, I hate what they're doing. It, make, it drives me nuts. It's wicked. It's disgusting. And I don't want to be part of it. And I want to be separate from it. And I don't even want to look at it. When they're going away from God, they're going to draw other people that way. So I'm not even going to look at them. When I'm at home alone, I'd rather walk with God than to let the wicked world come into my eyes and go down into my heart, take root, and eventually manifest in my life. Go to 1 Timothy chapter 3. 1 Timothy chapter 3. David gives us this idea of what behavior ought to look like. 1 Timothy 3, when you get there, find verse number 15. This, of course, was written from Paul to Timothy. What type of preachers to look for and how to keep things in order in church. And he says in verse 15, But if I tarry long that thou mayest know how thou oughtest to behave thyself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of the truth. He says we need to know how to behave ourselves in the house of God. And he goes through and gives us quite a list of things. And gossiping is one of the things. We shouldn't be talking about others. And we shouldn't have an envious attitude. And uh, we shouldn't be lifted up with pride. And there's all these things that he gave him. And his point is that we ought to know how to behave ourselves in the house of God. Jesus died for the church. And we ought to know how to treat each other. It's very important. If you would go back to 1 Samuel 18. 1 Samuel 18. We'll see this a couple more times in this chapter about how David behaved himself with wisdom. And that was his reputation. And because of it, the people fell in love with him. Just as Jonathan saw goodness in him, so did the people. And they said, yeah, that's a guy that we can hitch to. Like, he's got it figured out. This is a good leader. The nation was blessed because David was there serving the king and serving the people. So look at verse 6. We'll pick up where we left off. And it came to pass as they came when David was returned from the slaughter of the Philistines that the women came out of all the cities of Israel singing and dancing to meet King Saul with tabrets, with joy, and with instruments of music. And I, I'll pause here real quick because dancing in this situation is probably not what you think of when you think of dancing. If you, you know, music videos today, it's people dancing inappropriately, vulgarly, sensually to lead others astray, okay? And they teach that because they want to teach children how to do these vulgar things, right? That's not what this is. I want to remind you that we just came out of chapter 17 where all of the men were scared to death. There's a giant and thousands upon thousands of Philistines were as good as dead. There's nothing we can do. The women, now where were the women? It doesn't tell us. The women were back home, scared to death. My husband's going to die, and then they're going to ransack the city, and they're going to enslave us. My children might die. They were probably uh, huddled in a corner together, praying and crying and weeping and begging God for mercy. 
Of course, David came in, little old David. He said, well, I, we, he's, too, he's too big to miss. God is with me. Let's do this. And then they win. They get this big victory. And they come back. So when the women came in dancing, they're jumping up and down with joy. They're playing music and singing and praising God. It's not something sensual or inappropriate, okay? I just want you to understand that in context. Uh, they're with uh, tabrets and joy and with instruments and music, verse 7. And the women answered one another. They're singing back and forth as they played and said... Saul hath slain his thousands, and David his ten thousands. They're praising that their king had victories, and now their king's servant was also bringing great victories for their nation. Verse 8, And Saul was very wroth. He's angry. He's hateful at this point. And the saying displeased him, and he said, They have ascribed unto David ten thousands, and to me that have ascribed but thousands. And what can he have more but the kingdom? We see what really was driving Saul. Recognition. Pride. A title. I'm the one with the title. How dare they give anybody else any glory? They should be singing to me and leave everybody else out. I'm the king around here. You should let me be the one that they sing about. Really a bad attitude. Saul was full of pride, and now he's full of anger, and now he's beginning to be full of hate. He was hating David and his victory, forgetting that it saved his very life and his kingdom that he was a king over. Verse 9, and Saul eyed David from that day and forward. Remember we just read it in Psalm 23 about the man with an evil eye. What he says in his heart. We were warned about the evil eye. Now, well, now Saul as a Christian, has become that man. We're going to see Saul in heaven, no doubt. But here, he's hating David. Look at verse 10. It gets worse. <clears throat> and it came to pass on the morrow that the evil spirit from God came, from, came upon Saul, and he prophesied in the midst of the house. And David played with his hand, as at other times, and there was a javelin in Saul's hand. Uh, before I move on, I, just, I want to make a point here. Saul is in the house prophesying, which means preaching, of an evil spirit. Saul was discontent. He was hateful. He was envious. He was afraid. He was so angry and bitter that he was preaching hate. Do you know that not every preacher is preaching of the Holy Spirit. Some preachers will get behind a pulpit and they'll preach of their own spirit. They'll preach of an evil spirit. They'll preach hatred and foolishness and contention and strife and they'll preach violence. And let me tell you, let me tell you, that is not the fruit of the Holy Spirit. That is not of God. Saul is this classic hate preacher hating those that are around him because somebody thought they did a good job. And he's like, no, no, you give me the glory. There are many preachers out there like this. I know one. You may know one. There's probably more than, than we. I mean, we could, if we came up with a list, it'd probably be startling. God's will is that we would be a Jonathan or a David and not be a hate preacher like Saul who was filled with an evil spirit ready to kill those that were serving the Lord. This is important. It's not of the Holy Spirit. Verse 11, And Saul cast the javelin, for he had said, I will smite David even to the wall with it. He's like, I'm going to pin him to the wall with this spear. And David avoided out of his presence twice. Wow. Two times. It gives us this list. Right, so here's David singing, praying, Honoring God, trying to get rid of the evil spirit in Saul, and Saul's just so bitter against David. All he can think of, I want to kill him, I hate him, I'm going to destroy him, I'll pin him to the wall. Now, do you think David was afraid of Saul? No. David was afraid of no one but the Lord. Now, Saul had some problems. He was envious and afraid of David because God was with David. In fact, look at it. It says in verse 12, And Saul was afraid of David, 
because the Lord was with him and was departed from Saul. Therefore Saul removed him from him, right? So he kicks him out of the house, he's sending him off, and made him the captain over a thousand. And he went out and came in before the people. So uh, in the Bible it gives us these instructions that it shouldn't be one man over everybody. We see it in several places. We see it with uh, Moses, his father-in-law, comes and says, hey, you need captains over thousands and captains over hundreds and captains over uh, I think there's even some places captains of 50s, there's captains of 10s, and that's just good organization. If we got to the point in our church where there's a thousand people, we need at least 10 people organizing everything to keep everything God honoring, right? I mean, this is what he's talking about here. So he says, send David to run a thousand men. Okay, so those thousand men were serving and working with David now, and they came out and went in before the people. You know what that's talking about? They got together for war. They went out into the city, David and his thousand. They did great victories, and they came back in. And the people keep seeing David doing the work and doing the work consistently. Verse 14, And David behaved himself wisely in all his ways, and the Lord was with him. i got to tell you guys, this is the key to this chapter. David was full of wisdom, his behavior was that of a wise man, not a fool. And the Lord was with him because David chose to behave himself wisely. Verse 15, Wherefore, when Saul saw that he behaved himself wisely, he was afraid of him. But all Israel and Judah loved David because he went out and came in before them. And Saul said to David, Behold, my elder daughter, Merab. So he says, Hey, look at my daughter. Check out my daughter, right? Her will I give thee to wife. Only be thou valiant for me and fight for the Lord's battles. For Saul said, Let not my hand be upon him, but let the hand of the Philistines be upon him. So he says, I know what I'll do. If he's uh, married to the king's daughter, then they'll want to kill him. That's the plan. And David said unto Saul, Who am I? And what is my life? Do you see David's humility? He didn't say, yeah, I deserve the king's daughter. In fact, you promised her to me before I killed Goliath. He didn't say that. He said, who, who am I? I'm just little old David. I'm a humble youth. Humble. And David said to Saul, who am I and what is my life or my father's house in Israel that I should be son-in-law to the king? But it came to pass at the time when Merab, Saul's daughter, should have been given to David, that she was given unto Adriel, the Meholathite, to wife. So here Saul breaks his word concerning his wife. He gives her away to somebody else. Now we'll see it again in the future. He's going to give her Michael, and then later he's going to take her back, divorce, and give her to somebody else. That's what Saul's going to do, which is very wicked. Saul's a liar. Verse 20, And Michael, Saul's daughter, loved David, and they told Saul, and the thing pleased him. And Saul said, I will give him her, that she may be a snare to him. Does this sound like a dad that loves his daughter? Not at all. It doesn't sound like it at all. Oh, I'll, I'll give him that. She'll really mess him up. I mean, what a, what a bad guy. And at the hand of the Philistines may be against him. Wherefore Saul said to David, Thou shalt this day be my son-in-law, in the one of the twain, well, one way or another, you can marry one, one of the two and you'll, you'll be my uh, son-in-law. Verse 22, And Saul commanded his servants, saying, Commune with David secretly. He's working in secret. And said, Behold, the king hath delight in thee, and all his servants love thee. Now therefore be the king's son-in-law. And Saul's servants spake those words in the ears of David. And David said, Seemeth it to you a light thing to be a king's son-in-law? seeing that I am a poor man and lightly esteemed. This reminds me of the spirit and the attitude of Gideon. Gideon was a man who said, uh, my family is a poor, uh, the poor and I'm the least in the family. And God had said, go in this thy might. He said, yeah, no, I, I see your humility and your strength and your willingness to work and that's why I've picked you. And he's trying to tell God, who am I? I can't do this. We see that same spirit of humility right here with David. I have to tell you, pride destroys more youth. Being puffed up and thinking, look how good I am. Let me take a picture and put it on social media and show the world what I am as I covet after other people. Pride destroys. David was humble. Verse 24, 
And the servants of Saul told him, saying, On this manner spake David, and Saul said, Thus shall you say to David, The king desireth not any dowry, but an hundred foreskins of the Philistines, to be avenged of the king's enemies. But Saul thought to make David fall by the hand of the Philistines. He gives him this impossible task. Go out and cut off a hundred foreskins of the Philistines. That'll get rid of him. No, he won't be able to accomplish that. He'll die doing that, right? Verse 26, And when his servants told David these words, it pleased David well to be the king's son-in-law, and the days were not expired. In other words, he did it very quickly. Wherefore David arose and went, he and his men, and slew of the Philistines two hundred men. And David brought their foreskins, and they gave them in full tale to the king, that he might be the king's son-in-law. And Saul gave him Michael, his daughter, to wife. And Saul, Saul, and knew that the Lord was with David, and that Michael... Saul's daughter loved him. I just want to remind you here, as David is being uh, increased by the Lord, and Saul is losing the blessing, that he's slipping away from the Lord. I think he's losing his mentality in certain ways because he rebelled. He's losing his family. I don't think his daughters really loved him. He didn't love them. But he saw now that his daughter loved David. So he had, David had the things that Saul wanted that Saul couldn't get. Love and honor, respect, holiness, God's Spirit working through him to give him wisdom. All the things that Saul coveted after that he couldn't obtain because he was doing it the wrong way, David had been granted by the Lord. Verse 29, And Saul was yet the more afraid of David, and Saul became David's enemy continually. Did you notice it doesn't say David became Saul's enemy. David was still counted Saul as a friend. Saul said, he's my enemy. I've got to destroy him. I'm going to kill this guy one way or another. He's going to put me out of business. And he was right. But he could have gone about it a whole lot better. Verse 30, the last verse, it says, Then the princes of the Philistines went forth, and it came to pass after they went forth, that David behaved himself more wisely than all the servants of Saul, so that his name was much set by. Now even Saul's enemies knew how great David was, that the Lord was with him. He had a reputation on both sides of the field that this guy had great wisdom. God was with him. The people loved him. Everything he did just was successful. How, I mean, this is really fascinating to me. I think it's awesome. In fact, I want to go back to Psalm 101 for a minute. I want to talk a little more about this concept of behaving ourselves wisely. So much more it says that his name was set by. You know, you know what we do? We set things by. I have a lot of Bibles, but this is my favorite. I've had it for many years. It's so much my favorite that when it fell apart, I had to have it recovered. I don't take this Bible out soul winning because I don't want it to fall apart again. This is my studying Bible and my preaching Bible. I have set it aside for special purposes, right? Um, I'll often take one of, we give away those Bibles, those $1 Bibles, the Law of Liberty on the front of it. We give those away all the time. I take those out soul winning because if I drop it in the mud, no harm, no foul. You know what I mean? God's Word will still prevail. You know? But I, I, I've set this one by because it's kind of special to me. Maybe you have a, a coffee mug that just means something to you, or a relic, or something, a gift that somebody's given you. Or, or maybe you have two cars, and it's like, well, I don't drive the favorite one because I want to keep it nice. You know? we, all, we often set things aside because they're better. Well, that's how it was with David. When people spake of David, all they could say were good things about how God was working with him. It tells us four times in 1 Samuel 18 that he behaved himself wisely. This is the goal. How do we do that? He tells us in this chapter. Let's look again. Let's look at Psalm 101, verse 1. I will sing of mercy and judgment unto thee, O Lord, will I sing. Notice he's not singing of revenge, he's singing of mercy. I will behave myself wisely in a perfect way. Oh, when wilt thou come unto me? I will walk within my house with a perfect heart. If you notice that statement, when wilt thou come unto me? I don't think he's saying, oh, where are you, Lord? I don't see you. I think he's saying, 
you know, the Lord could show up at any moment. I, you know, I, don't, I think he's, you know, maybe I could die or maybe the presence of the Lord is with me at all times. And for that reason, when I'm walking through my house, I'm going to do it in a perfect way. Sometimes we don't feel the Lord, but he's there, isn't he? Right? Isn't he ever present in all of his creation? Isn't he dwelling with us and he'll never leave us nor forsake us? And he has a divine purpose for us and he wants to lead us and guide us as much as we'll allow him. And he says, it's like, well, God could show up at any minute. So in my house, while I'm all alone, I'm going to do things the right way. Right. So I don't have to, you know, I mean, you know, we've pro as kids, you ever been caught doing something, hand in the cookie jar, you're on the wrong TV channel, you're not supposed to be on, or you got the wrong music on, oh, I'm in trouble, right? David's saying, that's not going to happen to me. I'm not going to have wicked people in my house because God is with me at all times. Look, he says in verse 3, I will set no wicked thing before mine eyes. I hate the work of them that turn aside. It shall not cleave to me. A froward heart shall depart from me. I will not know a wicked person. That word froward, it's not forward, it's froward. You've heard the phrase to go to and fro. Toward God versus froward. You're going away from God. Froward means away from God in this application. To and fro. You're going back and forth. He says, I'm going toward God, and if you're not, if you're going away from God, I don't want you around me. There are certain people that have a reputation that they're getting more into what the world has to offer. They're getting more into the, the games and the social media and drunkenness and riotous living and foolishness and all they can think about is pleasing themselves and sensual living and what can I obtain and let me heap up riches. David says, I'm not interested in those people. I'd rather take somebody that's newly converted to the Lord, a babe in Christ, and they're excited trying to get closer to the Lord. I want to be with them, even though they may say some things that are wrong and they still have some rough edges, rather than be around some of the church people that have been, they know what to do, they've been doing it for 30 years, but in their heart they've turned away from the Lord and they're going away from the Lord in their lifestyle. He says, a froward heart shall depart from me. I will not know a wicked person. Verse 5, whoso privily slandereth his neighbor, him will I cut off. This is David telling us, this is my, you want to be my friend? Everybody wants to be a friend with the king. He says, if you're just privately slandering people with your tongue, I'm cutting you off. I don't want to hear that. You're going to come tell me, oh, you're not going to believe what this guy is doing. Okay, well, I, I don't care. We all make mistakes. If you're going to be a gossiper, you can go somewhere else. He says, Him that hath an high look and a proud heart will I not suffer. Pride. There it is. David says, I don't want proud people around me. They can't control themselves. Verse 6, Mine eyes shall be upon the faithful of the land. So what's he looking at in his house? What kind of people will stand in his house? Who are his close friends? Those that are faithful to God, that are known for being consistent they show up on time. They stay and do the work. They're the ones that are always talking about God. They're the ones that, have, that are trying to get closer to God. He says, Mine eyes shall be on the faithful of the land. They that may dwell with me, he that walketh in a perfect way, he shall serve me. He wouldn't even let his servants be wicked. Yeah, but he's really good and has this skill. I don't care. I'd rather the job be done poorly from a saved person than from the lost or a proud Christian. Verse 7, he that worketh deceit shall not dwell within my house. He that telleth lies shall not tarry in my sight. I will early destroy all the wicked of the land, that I may cut off all wicked doers from the city of the Lord. If you notice Dave, David's thought, he's talking about his heart. I will behave myself wisely. He's talking about his heart, and it affects his body, and then it affects his house. Who's going to be in my house? Let me tell you the kind of person I let in my house, and let me tell you who I kick out of my house. Why? And then he says, and let me show you what kind of city I'm trying to build. We're going to kick the evil people out. I will early destroy all the wicked of the land, that I may cut off all the wicked doers from the city of the Lord. David discovered that how he controlled his heart, his choices with his heart, affected all the way to the city walls. 
If we'll get this attitude, this mentality, and just say, okay, Lord, I have areas I need to work. I have struggles. I need victory, and I need spiritual success. Let me get your word in my heart. Let me get your word in my heart that I might not sin against thee. And then that word will begin to work itself out in your lifestyle, and you'll begin to change your body, and change your thoughts, and change your words, and change your actions. And then, and then before long, you'll change your whole house. Your whole house will have a reputation. Don't take that over to their house. They won't put up with it. They don't want to hear it. Don't ask them to turn that on. They don't want to be around it. They don't want to be involved. And the next thing you know, your house is going to affect somebody else's house and another house, and Lord willing, the whole city. You say, how can we turn Jacksonville, Florida around? I'll tell you, it's real easy. You start with your own wicked heart. Work on you. You get up, you look in the mirror, and you say, God, I found the problem. He's right here. And you're pointing in that mirror. God, this is the problem. This is why I'm failing. This is why I'm not better. Lord, Lord I want to serve you more, and i got to work on this guy first before I start telling everybody else where they're wrong. David succeeded because of humility. He saw the proud, the pride, the, the rebellion and the arrogancy of Saul. How it destroyed his family, his relationship with God, his household, his kingdom, his city. And here David, when he, when he became king, he said, I'm going to repair all this. And it starts with me. Will you behave yourself wisely? Will you be humble? Will you ask God for the strength to get the sin out of your life that he's asking you to work on? Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we love You so much. And Lord, we thank You for these stories of Jonathan and David, two great men that You've given us examples of men that honor You and serve You. Lord, I pray that You would help us to represent You this week as we go through the rest of the week. Lord, I ask that You would bless the soul winning on Saturday. Lord, I pray that You would help us to reach somebody that's lost and see them saved. Lord, I ask again that You would bring us visitors on Sunday. Lord, I, I just ask that You would use this church Help us to be a beacon of light in this community. Lord, I ask that you would help us to repair families and pull people back into serving you. Lord, we know that you have the power to do it, and we need your help. We can't do it without you. Lord, I thank you for the message tonight. I just ask that these words would stay with us and help us to get closer to you. I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.